Good morning. Uh, we are here February 6th as the County Council. We're in Council session and we will start today with a proclamation celebrating the Lunar New Year by Councilmember Mink and the County Executive and myself. Good morning. Good to see you. Good to see you. Come on in. Good morning and happy new, year. happy new Year. Happy New Year. All right. Thank you so much to everyone who has joined us here to celebrate the Lunar New Year 2024, Year of the Dragon. It's going to be a great year. Um, we're going to start off with uh, some remarks from County Executive Elrich, uh, and then I'll say a couple things, and then we will go into the proclamation uh, with myself, County Executive Elrich, and Council President Friesen. Great. Thank you. So we're in the, the midst of celebrating Lunar New Year, and uh, I'll say one of the great things I like about the tradition is this 30-day-plus celebration that began before New Year and will continue <laughs> long after New Year, which I say is a lot a lot of advantages over the American tradition of one night of drunken celebration <laughs> where you actually get to see people many times and you really are celebrating a new year and talking about a new year. So I do appreciate the cultural tradition. Uh, there are several different ways we say Happy New Year. I think you all understand Happy New Year. But there's also Shun Yen Kwai Ler and Shuk Mang Nam Moi. So those are two more ways to say Happy New Year. And that's, let you know how much we appreciate the Asian community here. This county has evolved a lot over the last 50 years. It was in 1970, this county was 95% white. Asian population was less than 1%. Today, the Asian population is 16%. One out of every six people in Montgomery County is now of Asian descent. And you play major roles in the community. You now have an elected official on the county council. You have an elected official on the school board. We already have representatives in the state legislature. So you're beginning both to gain political weight in the community, which is what would be appropriate, but you've always been present you know, in our schools and in the sciences. I've had the privilege of traveling to Taipei, Vietnam, India. We're about to go to China and Korea. And you know, we continue to benefit from the people who are here. I, I don't know if you know, we talk a lot about our diversity, but when we were in Taipei, um, India, and Vietnam, having people from the United States, from Montgomery County, who could talk about what it was like to be Vietnamese here, or Indian here, or Chinese here, was an enormous incentive for people to think about coming here. And when there are people we met there, and I literally in Taipei met people who had degrees from Johns Hopkins University of Maryland, somebody we met had actually gone to Montgomery College, all of that actually helps promote Montgomery County as we talk to people around the world about trying to come to Montgomery County and open up businesses. So we have a great relationship. This community is really, really present for all of us. Um, and I just really am grateful for the opportunity to work with you and look forward to continuing to work with you through the coming years. And this is, it's just been fun. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Um, so I'm Kristen Mink. I represent District 5 on the Montgomery County Council, and I have the honor and privilege of being the first AAPI County Council member here in Montgomery County. And I'm so, welcome, welcome. So I'm so grateful to be here with you all today. Um, this is a very special, as County Executive um, Ellers pointed out, uh, month plus for me, and it has, of course, always been for my family as well. Uh, my mom is a Chinese immigrant. Uh, she was born and raised in Malaysia, is of Chinese descent, uh, and came over here as a young adult uh, by herself uh, with not too much in her pocket. And um, now she's here in Montgomery County, settled here with my dad, finding Montgomery County to be a place that welcomed diversity, that welcomed her personally. And uh, now she has a daughter who is on the county council and gets to be here celebrating our very diverse and growing AAPI community. And I think it is important to note that the AAPI community is extremely diverse. It covers so many different uh, cultures, backgrounds, countries, of course. Uh, and this is a time of year when we get to celebrate uh, with so many of them. Uh, I was just at the uh, Tet Festival celebration um, with the uh, Maryland Vietnamese Mutual Association, and I got to be there with my kids. It's always wonderful when I can bring them, of course, to Lunar New Year celebrations. And it's so funny because not the night before, the very night before we went to the celebration, my, my littlest, uh, who is four, had said to my oldest, who is seven, how do you have money and I don't have money? And she said, I saved all my red packets from last year and you didn't. And, <laughs> and um, when we got to the MVMA celebration, uh, they were handing out red packets to the, you know, to the children. And um, my littlest got the red packet, opened up, there was $2 inside, very generous $2 inside. And she immediately immediately took it straight to the prize wheel, which cost $2 to spin. <laughs> and, uh, you know, donated that $2 and spun the prize wheel. And she, uh, and she got a pair of Little Mermaid swim goggles. And uh, her older sister said, what? why didn't you're supposed to save it? Why didn't you save it? And she said, there is nothing else that I wanted more in the world than this pair of swim goggles. <laughs> and I said, wow, well, that is just incredibly lucky. What are the chances? <laughs> so here we are in the very, very lucky year of the dragon. May it be that lucky for all of us and for this county. Um, I may be the first on this county council from the AAPI community, but given our growth, given the community organizing that this community continues to do, I know that I am the first of what will be very, very many. So thank you all so much for everything, everything that you do, both for the AAPI community and for Montgomery County as a whole. You are um, an essential part of who we are here in Montgomery County and what continues to make this county a wonderful, fantastic, exciting place to live. So thank you all so very much. And we will now uh, jump into reading the proclamation. Um, and uh, Council President Friesen, you want to kick us off? Sure. Proclamation from Montgomery County, Maryland, whereas Montgomery County is home to a multitude of cultures, languages, and traditions from all around the world, and whereas the Asian American and Pacific Islander community is now one of the fastest growing communities in Montgomery County, representing over 16% of the total population and have made innumerable contributions to the economic, cultural, and civic growth of Montgomery County, and Whereas Lunar New Year is one of the most important holidays for many Asian Americans living in Montgomery County and whereas 2024 is the year of the dragon, the dragon is considered to be the luckiest and most auspicious of all zodiac animals. The year of the dragon signifies a fresh start, unprecedented opportunities, and the laying of foundation for long-term success and Whereas festivities across the county will showcase the richness of Asian culture and highlight the importance of family togetherness. Now, therefore, do we, Mark Elrich as county executive, Andrew Friedson as council president, and Kristen Mink as council member of Montgomery County, Maryland, and I'll add all the other council members who are behind us, hereby <laughs> proclaim February 10th as Lunar New Year Day in Montgomery County. We encourage the residents to join us in recognizing the contributions of the Asian American community and take part in the celebrations across the county. Signed the sixth day of February in the year 2024. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> 
by Mark Elrich, Andrew Friedson, and myself, Kristen Mink. Thank you all so much. Okay, happy Year of the Dragon. Thank you to Councilmember Mink and the County Executive for uh, that and all of the tremendous community leaders who've joined us today to honor the Lunar New Year, but also the AAPI community, one out of six residents in Montgomery County that we are so proud uh, to uh, be uh, home to and, and uh, to, to be able to call our neighbors. We're going to move on to general business. Uh, we will now... Uh, Move on to general business. There are no announcements today. The minutes from council meetings on January 17th, 22nd, 23rd, 25th, uh, and the January 25th public hearing have been circulated to colleagues. Are there any object uh, objections to approving these minutes? Seeing no objections, these minutes now stand. We are now going to move on and are pleased to welcome Dr. Nina Ashford, the County Executive's nominee for Chief of Public Health and Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome Dr. Ashford and I believe Mr. Madalino who is here. 
and Dr. Bridgers, I didn't see you in the back, I apologize, please join us and several colleagues from the department, which uh, we welcome and it's good to see, including our health officer, it's good to see you. Let me turn it over to you, uh, CAO Madalino. You can uh, introduce and kick us off, and then we can move forward. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. President, members of the Council. Thrilled to have our nominee for the Division Chief for Public Health Services, Dr. Nina Ashford. Um, when the last Council worked with us to divide the position of Health Officer and Division Chief, I think this is exactly the type of candidate we had hoped for to take over the Public Health Service. Um, after Dr. Bridgers, of course, who was our first nominee in that, in that um, position. Uh, but um, she comes to us with uh, a wealth of experience at the highest levels of the federal government and health policy at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, having been the director of the Office of Minority Health, um, been engaged with and understanding the unique model of health care provision and reimbursement we have in the state of Maryland. And on top of all of that, a Montgomery County resident who really wanted to come back and work at a local government and more importantly, her local government in order to improve health outcomes for our community. I know several of you have met with her and I think shared the same level of, 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 of I'm trying to think of impression, but I know the, um, uh, of excitement to have her join the county government in this leadership position. Um, so on behalf of the county executive, I humbly ask for your support for her confirmation in this important role. Thank you for that. Dr. Bridgers, anything to add? Good morning, Council President Freitz, and I say that emphatically because that's the first time I've had to had the <laughs> pleasure of addressing you then in the council this morning. Um, I am excited again to sit with a great candidate for one of the senior positions in the Department of Health and Human Services. Just a brief story, if you will. So the senior team, welcome, are all wearing Care Bears. And when Dr. Ashford did her preliminary rounds of interviews, she was very passionate about her work. And they dubbed her a Care Bear, uh -huh. a community Care Bear. So we are all wearing Care Bear because she demonstrated the resolve to examine the challenges with sexual and reproductive health, to address or work with the team to address youth safety issues, to be and place diversity, equity, and inclusion at the forefront of all the work that we continue to do in public health, to look at those maternal and child health issues, to think about value-based care and patient-centered health care in the community and to lastly assist me along with our senior leaders who joined us today to develop and identify positive health and human services in Montgomery County. It is for those reasons that I just articulated that I smile this morning to sit with you in Dr. Ashford's interview. Thank you for the opportunity to bring those remarks. Council President Friedson. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, the the care bear of community health. I appreciate that that story. Before we we start and 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 turn it over to our our candidate, Dr. Ashford, I did just want to thank uh, Dr. Christopher Rogers for stepping in and to serving our community. I know that there's a lot of members of the team here, but in speaking of the team, uh, we really have leaned on his efforts and and his work. And on behalf of the entire council, just wanted to take this opportunity uh, to to thank him for being the acting chief of public health and. Uh, really appreciate uh, his public service uh, to the department, to, to the county, and as a partner to all of us. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. So with that, let's turn it over to our, our nominee, uh, Dr. Ashford. Welcome. Uh, thank you for your interest in serving in this role. Could you please describe your experience, background, and education as they relate to the position of Chief of Public Health Services and implementing public health policies? Yes. Well, first, I would just like to take this opportunity to briefly thank the council for allowing me to be here today, thanking the county executive for the nomination, the support of the um, senior leadership team of DHHS and my husband, who's in the audience, um, and uh, other uh, 
uh, family friends who are here as well. Um, also, just want to echo the thanks for Dr. Rogers and his leadership over the past year. Um, so you could say my public health journey started before I formally knew about the field or really understood the core tenets of public health. What I did know was that I had a passion for health and I had a passion for helping. Um, I really started as a health educator on my local campus, teaching my fellow student body about safe spring break and sexual reproductive health practices. Ultimately, I decided to obtain my Master's of Public Health with a concentration in community-oriented primary care. And I picked this concentration specifically for my deep passion and commitment for community voices and community engagement. This model says that community are the experts in the problems that plague them. They also have to be part of identifying and implementing the solutions if we're going to see true advancement in health outcomes. I completed my Doctor of Public Health with a focus in health behavior while working full-time at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So you might say I'm crazy or efficient. I don't know. You can pick. Um, which really, uh, a focus on health behavior, which gave me a deeper insight into the individual mechanisms that drive behavior change. Over my career, I've had the opportunity to work across multiple sectors. I've worked in academic medicine, leading a large multi-sector stroke disparities project for African Americans in Washington, D.C. I joined the fight against HIV shortly after D.C. Re released its seminal Appleseed report highlighting the unacceptable and devastating disparities. I had the privilege of serving as a program evaluator for a small nonprofit that was supporting young people living with and affected by HIV. This is where I discovered my passion for program evaluation and leveraging both quantitative and qualitative approaches to assess outcomes. Following the passage of the Affordable Care Act, I had the opportunity to shift my career focus to transforming our delivery system. So I spent the next 11 years of my career working at the federal level, leading various programs and developing policies to transform our system. At the Health Resources and Services Administration, I supported community health centers in patient-centered medical home recognition. We wanted to make sure that they were competitive and well-positioned to capitalize on the country's transition to value-based care. I then transitioned to the CMS Innovation Center where I had the opportunity to develop and implement programs focused on population health and prevention for Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. Um, most recently, I've been at Tufts University School of Medicine, having the privilege to teach the next generation of public health professionals and physicians. I've also had the distinct honor of joining the fight in the maternal, uh, maternal uh, mortality crisis in this country as the Maternal and Child Health Policy Director at the Center for Black Maternal Health and Reproductive Justice. My professional experience has been an incredible marriage across multiple sectors. These experiences have given me a frontline view to the power of cross-sector collaboration and the level of integration that's truly needed between public health and healthcare to see change in our health outcomes. It embodies centering community voices and authentic partnership that's needed um, to achieve our advances in health equity. If confirmed, I am honored and humbled um, by the opportunity to bring this experience to the community where I live. Thank you. Uh, the uh, Chief Administrative Officer mentioned the splitting of the two positions, the Chief of Public Health Services and the County Health Officer. Mm -hmm. Could you describe your understanding of the interface between those uh, two positions and how they would work yeah. in tandem with one another and also how you would work with the County Council, which in Montgomery County also sits as the Board of Health. Yes, absolutely. Um, so my understanding is that the Chief of Public Health Services plays a critical role in ensuring the health, safety, and well-being of all residents within the county. Um, this role works in close partnership with Dr. Bridgers, the Director of DHHS, as well as Dr. Davis, the County Health Officer. Um, the position is responsible for the day-to-day -day management and oversight of the core functions of public health services. Uh, this includes leading the incredibly talented team within public health services. Um, uh, who are working hard on the front lines every day and will also require close collaboration with the other DHHS chiefs as well as Montgomery County as a whole when we talk about help in all policies, right? This cannot just sit and live within DHHS. As the Board of Health, the County Council has all of the powers of a local Board of Health as, under state law. So to be successful, it will be critical for this role to engage in direct conversation with you, 
the council. Um, for example, I've thoroughly enjoyed my conversations with Council Member Stewart, Stewart to hear more about some of the transgender health disparities and priorities that she is focused on um, and how we can support um, and improve transgender health across the county. I have also had some great conversations with Council Member Belcombe talking about the uh, health, rural health needs and access to care challenges for the residents in her district. I genuinely look forward to continuing these conversations with each of you individually to learn about the priorities in your areas. You have a direct line to your residents in your districts. You hear from the front lines what the problems are, what the barriers are, what the challenges are, and I look forward to that authentic partnership and continuing those conversations and dialogue. Um, most importantly, this position has to center the voices of the community to understand their needs and how we can support our residents in achieving and maintaining optimal health. Thank you. Uh, what measures would you take to advance racial equity and social justice and reduce disparities through public health services programs countywide? Yeah. So first, I really want to applaud the county council um, for passing the resolution on declaring racism a public health crisis. Um, it was a bold move and it was a brave move when, um, and you were really a leader in that effort um, across the country. Unfor unfortunately, we saw COVID-19 exacerbate um, already existing disparities, right? And um, our minority communities and our most vulnerable and under-resourced communities bore the brunt of those poor outcomes. Unless we're willing to acknowledge the devastating and insidious nature of racism and its impacts on health, we'll never make improvements in health equity and be able to truly advance health equity. Um, we have to look beneath the symptoms of poor outcomes and delve into the systemic inequalities that actually drive those poor outcomes. I'm an individual who truly believes that diversity is our strength. Um, I've committed my career to advancing health equity and social justice through the development of programs and policies that explicitly focus um, disparities elimination. So there exists a number of measures that can be taken in order to advance racial um, equity in the county. The first is looking at data. We don't know what the problems are if we don't have the data to understand what's happening. And Montgomery County is one of those tricky places where when you look at the population as a whole and you look at the outcomes for the population of a whole, we're doing pretty good. We are typically better than the state average, better than the national averages, but when you start to disaggregate that data and look at outcomes specific to our racial and ethnic minority populations, we have problems and we have room to grow. Um, so that would be the first piece. We also need that data to be able to evaluate the effectiveness and efficacy of our programs, right? We should be engaged in formative process and impact evaluations to see the outcomes and impacts of our programs, to see the return on investment and the value that our residents are actually receiving from our programs. And most importantly, to see if we're actually moving the needle to drive and close the gaps in those disparities. Once we have the data and an integrated way to center community voices, the agency must have an unwavering focus and commitment to achieve health equity. So each program should have the advancement of health equity at its core. This is non-negotiable. This is the North Star for our programs. It can't just be a topic of discussion once the outcomes have been calculated and we see that there's problems. It needs to be the central focus and tenant of our programs. Finally, we can't make progress in disparities without addressing the role of the social determinants of health. Um, when we're implementing and developing policies and programs, we have to take a holistic approach and view to really understand the social determinants of health and the role that they play in exacerbating the disparities that we see in the county. Thank you. Uh, public health services consist of a number of programs that engage very closely and directly with other county departments and agencies, mm -hmm. such as school health and license and regulatory services. What opportunities do you see in public health services to transform and innovate those programs to better ne meet the needs of our Montgomery County residents? Yeah. Thank you for that question. So there's one thing that came across loud and clear in the interviews with the community dialogue, the chiefs, Dr. Bridgers, Dr. Davis, and that is there is a critical need to better integrate services and eliminate the silos, 
within the county. Um, and it's going to be critical to take a human-centered design approach to really understand how our residents interface, how they utilize our services, and what their experiences are, what's working well, what could be better, um, in order for us to try and break down those silos and get residents the services for which they are entitled. Um, the next opportunity I would know is the integration of behavioral health and primary care, given the huge impact um, that mental health has on exacerbating health outcomes. It's going to be critical to continue to innovate in this space through partnership and collaboration. In doing this work, and one of the things that I find most exciting about public health is the multi sector collaboration. So we have to leverage public-private partnerships. Um, we have to identify opportunities for mutual collaboration between public health services, DHHS, and the local Montgomery County business entities. Um, this should reach beyond traditional health care. This is an opportunity to think strategically about newer innovative partnerships and really focusing on that health for all approach to how we can try and move outcomes within the county. And since license and regulatory and school health were specifically highlighted, um, I would like to address those areas directly. Uh, for license and regulatory, I had the opportunity to have a conversation with Dr. Bridgers and I look forward to working with him to develop a plan to present to the council on how we can streamline the regulatory review um, processes. For school health, I am excited to join Dr. Davis um, in her youth harm work, having started my public health career in sexual, reproductive, and adolescent health. I'm eager to leverage these experiences to help our young people achieve their full potential while using a family systems approach. Appreciate that. We've already hit the ground running, it sounds like. Uh, so you might have preempted my, my next question. Oh, sorry. But, uh, in this role as uh, Chief of Public Health Services, what would be your immediate priorities and what would you see as longer term initiatives that you'd like to embark on? Yeah, absolutely. So first, I do want to thank, take a moment and reiterate my thanks to Dr. Rogers for his leadership over the past year. Um, I also want to thank the dedicated team, the public health services team that is and has been on the front lines. Me and my family have personally benefited from your hard work and dedication, whether it's the expert and evidence-based approach to COVID or school health policies that my children have been benefited from in Montgomery County Public Schools or early education centers. We benefit every day from your hard work, and so I want to take an opportunity to say thank you. Um, practically speaking, my first priority is to listen. Um, I realize that I'm going to need to get up to speed with the current programs, the structure, and the culture. I believe that the team on the front lines are the experts in the work. They are there. They know the ins. They know the outs. Um, they know what's going well. They know the areas for improvement and I will rely heavily on them to learn, to listen, and figure out how I can best support them to move the barriers out of the way. I am the type of leader where there is no job that is beneath me. I will roll up my sleeves and get in the weeds with you, um, whatever that looks like, and I am looking forward to being able to do that with the team. My next priority is to operationalize some of the innovations and ideas I highlighted in previous answers. Specifically, I'm really excited to work with my fellow chiefs to figure out how do we actually break down the silos and barriers to our residents getting care. Um, I'm eager to look for synergies and cross collaborations across Montgomery County government as a whole, as well as leveraging those public-private partnerships. My third priority is to immediately integrate with the Community Health Improvement Plan process, which I understand is already underway. I'm excited um, to work with Dr. Bridgers, Dr. Davis, with the council and with the community to identify what our key priorities are and really develop a strategic vision for health in the county. Um, Montgomery County can be the gold standard for local public health in the nation, and I'm excited to make that a reality. Since I'm no stranger to this type of work, I very much anticipate that all of these priorities will need to be balanced with the day-to-day -day and unexpected needs and challenges that are a normal part of public health practice. So I look forward to working with the team and building a model that can innovate and grow while also being resilient to address the emerging threats because there will always be emerging threats. That's just the nature of the job. Appreciate that. Are there any conflicts of interest that you think we should be aware of? No, there are none. Okay, great. Uh, all right, I have several uh, colleagues in the queue. We'll start with the chair of the uh, Health and Human Services Committee, Councilmember Member Albernaz. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Dr. Ashford, it's so good to see you this morning. I really enjoyed our conversation last week. Your resume is impeccable. And I really picked up on the energy and the passion that you have for this work. And I think both of those traits are going to serve you well in this position moving forward. And 
Most importantly, thank you for choosing the profession of public health mm -hmm. as your area of focus. We know how difficult, particularly during COVID, these positions became. Yeah. Um, and one of the few silver linings, however, uh, during that time was there was a real emphasis and an acknowledgement and understanding of the role that public health plays in our overall community. Uh, somebody's health in Poolsville should matter to somebody's health in Wheaton. Somebody's health in Potomac should matter to somebody's health in the eastern part of our county. And it was a, a, a chaotic, challenging, uh, and at times depressing time. Um, but coming out of it, I do feel that we are stronger than we were before COVID. And uh, under Dr. Bridger's leadership and that of Dr. Davis and our public health team, uh, we've really made some great strides. And I want to uplift a couple of comments that you made in the response to our council president's questions, which I really appreciated. Uh, and one is partnership and collaboration. Uh, we have an incredible infrastructure here within our county government and our state government as well of public health leaders that are doing outstanding and innovative work every day. Um, but we also have this unique tapestry of nonprofit organizations and even for-profit organizations mm -hmm. that have to support and lean in on each other if we're truly going to address those underlying issues that you so uh, effectively enumerated. And so um, I know that you will continue the great work of Dr. Rogers and Dr. Davis and the public health team. And so I just had two quick questions, um, which we discussed in our interview, but I'd like to uplift for my colleagues because I think it's important for them to hear this as well. Uh, dental health is public health. Yeah. Uh, and there has been an understanding and emphasis, and we have friends in a wonderful organization uh, in Action in Montgomery that through an assessment through these faith-based organizations, uh, they do these community surveys to find out what issues are important to uh, their constituents and dental health came up as an unexpected topic. Um, so could you talk a little bit about your perspective on the importance of dental health as public health? And uh, I know that you provided me assurances we will continue the momentum we've been able to build under Dr. Rogers' leadership uh, in helping to infuse a much stronger infrastructure in dental health. But if you could talk a little bit about what your plans are in that area, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question. So dental health is, uh, when we think about whole person care, dental health is a critical component of that, right? We can't divorce our teeth <laughs> from the rest of our bodies. And if anybody's had a toothache, you know that it is all consuming, right? It is impossible. Also, we know that poor dental health and hygiene um, can lead to other chronic issues like cardiovascular problems and are precursors for a lot of other chronic health issues. So everything is connected. Um, I I very much look forward. Um, I've heard about the great work that Dr. Rogers has done to increase dental access as well as some of the innovative, innovative strategies like the mobile dental clinics. I look forward to continuing that work and improving and increasing dental access in the county. I also understand some of the early learnings from that is when you have populations of folks who have not been to a dentist in year, a cleaning and a hygienist visit might not be sufficient enough, right? Um, once you get in there, you realize there's lots of problems. They might need higher acuity care. So I look forward to working with the council, leveraging the work that Dr. Rogers has done and working with the broader community to figure out what are the connections and partnerships we can make to not just get everybody basic access to dental hygiene and dental cleanings, but also when they need root canals or they need bridges or they need that higher acuity care. Um, how can we make sure that they have access to those services in a timely and affordable way? Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I'll just close with this because I know other colleagues have questions as well. So in a recent uh, survey conducted by our Department of Health and Human Services, and you alluded to this in your responses as well, behavioral health came up as the number one issue uh, facing our constituents, which they have self-identified as a huge challenge in their families and in our community. That's particularly impacting our vulnerable populations, yeah. our youth, uh, are really just screaming for help right now. Um, and this public health and all policy um, is something that we really have to expand upon uh, that impacts every single committee that uh, reports to this body. And so I'll end with this. Uh, and again, Council President Freitzen alluded to this. There's a unique construct here in that we sit as the Board of Public Health. And we do that for a couple of reasons. One, it's state mandate. Um, but two, 
it reflects the unique partnership between your uh, work and ours on the council um, because we have tools at our disposal that you do not have and you have tools at your disposal that we do not have and so we will need to continue as we have been uh, this two-way conversation dialogue strategic planning uh, and I am I know you are committed to that work we are committed to that work and I really look forward to working with you thank you so much thank you uh, thank you next up uh, Councilmember Glass uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, Dr. Ashford, nice to see you. Uh, I appreciate your, your opening comments and, and your presentation. You are ready to go. Uh, the energy, enthusiasm, and intellect of which uh, you've thought about the issues in our community. And, and what I very much uh, appreciate about you is that you've moved up the ranks and you have you started in the community. You started on campus. You started working with young people at Metro Teen Aids, uh, and then you started working with older people at CMS, right? Uh, and, and I think that is the circle of life, uh, truly, and puts you in an incredible position to work with the incredible team, the HHS leadership team that is all here, uh, literally backing you, right? Um, and we got a lot of work to do, yeah. as has been noted. Um, the one question I have, uh, among many um, is about the opi opioid epidemic uh, that we here in the county are facing, that communities across the country are facing. Over the last decade here in Montgomery County, the, the opioid epidemic has resulted in nearly a 200 percent increase in intoxication deaths. And from, from your perspective, from the community perspective uh, and from a county perspective, how do you think that we as a community can help manage this, recognizing it is a big issue, uh, of which the President of the United States currently is trying to, to deal with as well, with the, the drugs coming into the United States, but how do we as a community help grapple this? Yeah, absolutely. As in most things in public health, I think this is where you have to take that multi-pronged approach, right? So you have the public safety perspective where we deal with that exact issue of how do we focus, or how do we um, help manage the flow of opioids into the county? The truth of the matter is they are here and they are causing harm. So we also need to look at how do we effectively support our community members, our young people, our the adolescents, um, uh, with the rising use of fentanyl and the devastating effects that's, have, that's having. Um, there are multiple strategies, whether that is a health education approach about the awareness and the harmful effects, support families of our young people and how do they identify whether or not their child might have a opioid or other substance use problem getting them then connected to the necessary behavioral health treatment um, that is not without its own challenges because like the rest of the country we do have a behavioral health shortage so we also need to be thinking creatively and innovatively about what tools and practices can we use to be able to address the sort shortage so that when individuals are seeking help there is someone at the other end of that reach out um, and then we need to think about what our harm reduction practices look like within the county do we have safe syringe spots do we have other public evidence-based Based public health practices that have been shown to reduce harm do we have opportunities there's been some really cool um, uh, programs that have been done where there are um, naloxone access points and um, to be able to mitigate the effects of overdoses methadone buprenorphine we need to pull together the entire arsenal of tools that we have to come at this epidemic. It can't just be telling people not to use substances, but how are we actually getting at the underlying causes um, and looking at it from all levels of the county government so that we can hopefully um, see a reduction in that 200% increase. Thank you for that, that thoughtful response. Clearly it goes back to the opening comments you made about not stovepiping and making sure that we're all working on the same team. And I know that we are all working on the same team when it comes to this work. So thank you and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Councilor Draw. Thank you. Good morning and, and uh, congratulations on being before us today. As you can hear, I think it's going to go okay. Um, and. Uh, we're all very happy to, to see the great leadership of your whole team. And I love the Care Bears. I love Care Bears. So I just <laughs> save an extra one if you have one. But, you know, if you, if you, if you, council, all councilmen probably want one. Um, I just have one question. You mentioned the uh, 
uh, racism as public health resolution, yeah. which I introduced and the whole council, the previous council supported in 2020. It's hard to believe it's been four years. Yeah. Um, we laid out a number of actions in that resolution and it was cited recently at a, at a meeting we had. Um, and one of them was uh, to promote, uh, to advocate locally and nationally for relevant policies that improve health in all communities of color and support local, state, regional, and federal initiatives that advance efforts to dismantle systemic racism. You talked about uh, a couple of the areas where I think, uh, in my view, it is, uh, and I think the view of many, it's unacceptable that in the HIV AIDS area that black women last year, two years ago, accounted for like nine, over 90% of the cases, I think not much different the year after that, uh, that maternal health uh, in our communities of color continues to be a problem. You know, the, the nearly 12,000 babies that are born here every year. Um, talk to me about how you think you can leverage the work that in your career and the work that's already been done to put meaningful heft and a plan and, and data behind improving these outcomes. Because I, there's an urgency now more than ever that I know you share, but I feel like we haven't made as enough progress as I as I want to, uh, and it's it's uh, as all of us want to. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question. Um, as I as I shared in my answers, the data and understanding where we are in terms of those disparities, so we know what our baseline is and know the goals we're ultimately trying to achieve, are critically important. I'll just. There are many topic areas we could pick. I'll focus on the maternal and child health issue. Um, uh, we are in a black maternal health crisis in this country. Black women are three to four times more likely to die during childbirth than their white counterparts. With that said, maternal outcomes are bad for everybody, right? When you look at the United States compared to other OECD nations, um, it is a problem. I think we have to look broadly at what our strategies and solutions are. Often in the maternal health space, we think, oh, these are moms on Medicaid who have lower income and lower resources that are being impacted. Now, Medicaid does cover 50% of all births, so that is a fair assumption. However, when we look at the data for black women and birthing people in particular, we know that who is being impacted are high socioeconomic status, highly educated, women with private insurance and access who are having babies later in life um, and that because of the insidi insidious nature of racism it is directly impacting their care experiences so we can't just rely on giving everybody a doula yes doulas are an evidence-based approach we should definitely be doing that we also need to look at what the policy lovers are from a county we know that birth centers result in better outcomes for black birthing people, right? Um, so how do we reduce any of the regulatory barriers to having and establishing birthing centers within Montgomery County so that all birthing people have access, especially black and brown birthing people who are being disproportionately impacted by this crisis? Um, we also need to think innovatively about how do we partner with our healthcare system to address the implicit bias and some of these um, beliefs that have been honestly embedded in the graduate and medical education. This is not just a Montgomery County issue, it's an issue across the country. Um, and you know, that's not saying that healthcare providers are bad or that they uh, have these bad ideas, but how do we work with them to um, understand a listening and hearing um, and cultural humility, right? Implicit bias training is great, but a two-hour training is not going to dismantle 400 years of systemic racism that has been embedded in this country. Um, so I say all of that to say is we need to take multiple measures. We need to work at multiple angles, but we need to see the data in real time. So we need data from our healthcare partners on severe obstetric complications. We need data on maternal mortality rates. We need to be able to track that information real time, not just in a two-year lag, to see are we having an impact, are we moving a needle, and are we forming authentic partnerships to make that happen? Thank you. I know you could say more. I look forward to working with you yeah. on those issues and others. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor Geron. I just want to note, CEO Madalino has to go to an official responsibility across the street. We appreciate you joining us and, and bringing this candidate forward. Uh, let's keep the one question per colleague. Uh, uh, going uh, in the interest of time, we have six colleagues still in the queue. Next up is Councilmember Fonda Gonzalez. Good morning. Um, 
the first thing that crossed my mind when I heard you speak is like, how come I haven't met her? It's impossible. <laughs> um, so, and that's a good thing. Not a good thing that, you ha that we haven't met, but um, it's a good reaction from me, especially coming from me. Um, when I saw your resume, besides all your experience in the health you know, arena, I would just say, I love the fact that you highlighted under your areas of excellence, coalition building and advocacy. And uh, I'm going to tell you that last week I hosted a youth town hall in my mm -hmm. district. So kids from middle schools and high schools, about nearly 150 kids showed up. Okay, that's a huge deal. Uh, most of them black and brown, I would say 80% of them. And um, I shared the minutes and the issues with Dr. Beers already and, and Madaleno and, and the account executive. I haven't released them to the public, but I will soon. I just wanted them to know just because the operating budget is coming is coming up. And if you look at the county council's Twitter account, you see that a video about this town hall was just released this morning. And I'm sharing this because it was so heartbreaking to hear our young people, I'm telling you 12, 13, 14 year old girls and boys, when, I, when we asked them, you know, what are the challenges that, that you see in your community? The main thing was mental health issues, the fentanyl crisis, seeing drugs all over the schools, um, getting, you know, having people coming into the school who do not belong in the school, selling drugs easily. Those, that were, those were the issues that kids were saying to me. Um, and you'll see that in some of the videos and, um, that you see today if you watch, if you go to the social media account. Um, I think, and this is what I told Dr. Beers and me, Rich Madeleine, and the executive, is that I think that in this county, although with great intentions, we have different groups. You know, that you have HHS, you have the Rec Department, you have multiple police. Everybody's working by themselves, and there's no one pulling people together. And, um, and kids are telling us that. Okay, there's no place for them. We need more diversion programs, places that where kids feel safe, uh, where they can feel like they can talk about these issues. We need to invest more money on nonprofits that really focused on, you know, uplifting them and seeing their talent. And that's part of, of public health, all of it. Yeah. Um, so I'm, all that to say, so it's not really a question just to get things going. I have high expectations on you. Thank you. And I need somebody who can drag all these departments together and push things forward because we're not doing that. We're not. And I need you to understand that. Yeah. Um, even with all the good intentions that we have. And Dr. Beers knows me as the person that if I call and I send her an email, it's probably not a good thing <laughs> because it's me asking for help. Dr. Santiago in the back too. Um, the situation is horrible, okay. and I don't think we are doing enough to care for our children right now. Money is not even an issue. We have lots of money. It's being intentional with our, with our money and putting the right people together to move things forward. So with that, I yield back, Council President. You don't need to say anything. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, 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 Council Vice President Sewer. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I'm so glad I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. the voice the There's a lot of us. There's a lot of issues. Um, and uh, I'm just I'm thrilled. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me on Friday. Um, I think as my colleagues have said, uh, we are so excited about your nomination. Um, for me, as we as we've talked, um, uh, you, you are the full package. You yeah. bring so much just basic knowledge and experience and as council member Natalie Fani Gonzalez just said an understanding of how this work yeah. has to be done in our communities um, so I do want to I know people have brought up a number of issues and public health the, the wonderful thing about public health is you never get bored because it's, <laughs> it's something different every hour um, and um, I do want to ask you, though, um, since we've just got the Office of Legislative Oversight report on trans health care in the community, uh, our community partners and our LGBTQ plus um, uh, 
outreach person did a great job heading up a community survey that we just got uh, this fall. But unfortunately, even though we have these great reports, the what they report on is not great. Yeah. Um, we have very limited services for trans health care here. In fact, we are viewed as a desert when it comes in, ter uh, in terms of this health care. Our LGBTQ plus community told us in the survey that they face great barriers, including fear of mistreatment and difficulty finding a provider for gender affirming care. We've also talked about, as Councilmember Jawando raised, the HIV rates um, in our community. Uh, we know through the actions of Governor Moore, who has been outspoken on this issue, that Maryland is now a sanctuary state for our trans community and medical professionals, which is wonderful. Which you know, We know that we have families who are coming here seeking care to our wonderful county, um, but we don't have enough services even for the people who are currently living here. Um, so I know uh, I've spoken to many people in the department about this, and we have an incredible department. And I just want to say thank you to all of you. Thank you for coming today. Um, but um, you know, if you get this position, which I think you will, uh, <laughs> I'm curious to know, like, where where do you see particularly um, the path forward on these issues? Yeah, well, first I just want to applaud the OLO report. I think this is a great example of getting direct feedback from the community on what the gaps and the barriers are. Um, while the results are hard to read on paper, we at least know what the issues are and how big of a road ahead we have to climb. Um, the fact that we do have a care desert for our LGBTQ um, residents and specifically our trans residents is mind-blowing to me given a county as well resourced uh, both uh, with medical professionals <laughs> and fancy institutions um, that this is a challenge that we are facing. I think the county has an opportunity leveraging those public-private partnerships that I spoke about in some of my previous uh, responses to think about how do we make Montgomery County really um, the destination, a bastion for LGBTQ health, a safe place so that where, um, whether they are residents of the county or others that are coming in from other states because they live in states that don't have um, inclusive uh, gender affirming care or other um, have other harmful policies that might prevent um, them from receiving respectful care, we can be that destination and we can be that source. I think we also need to work with our healthcare community on making sure that they have the skills and understanding to provide care in a way where our LGBTQ community feels respected they feel safe, they can show up as them, their whole selves, right? And they leave feeling heard, they leave feeling like their needs were met, and that we are addressing the issues that they have highlighted as being most prevalent, whether that is access to um, pharmacological therapy to support transition, whether that is access for surgery, for um, uh, gender reassignment, whatever that might be, right? We need to make sure that we are able to provide those services and that we are able to work with our healthcare community to ensure that our LGBTQ community feels safe, they feel like they have access, and that we are increasing access to those, those programs. Great, thank you. And if I could do a shout out to the Blair principal, uh, Renee Johnson, who just came in, for my children who went there, and I just want to say on this topic, Renee is a standout educator, making a, a, a wonderful welcoming community for our LGBTQ plus students at Blair. Here, here to that. So thanks for being here and thanks for your service to the community. We appreciate it. Let me turn it to Council Member Sales. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just want to thank, uh, share the sentiments of my colleagues and thanking Dr. Rogers for his leadership and service uh, during the most trying times um, in our nation's history. Um, thank you to the county executive. I'm sorry, Mr. Madaleno had to leave um, and Dr. Bridgers and the entire HHS team for being here to support uh, the candidate, Dr. Ashford. Thank you for recommending her. Uh, to fulfill this important role of the Chief of Public Health Services. Um, I serve as the Council's lead for eliminating disparities in public health, and so a lot of the questions I had have already been asked regarding um, black maternal health and eliminating disparities um, in um, the HIV AIDS epidemic, which black women are the most impacted population in our county. 
Um, and so given your role as the Evaluation and Program Development Manager at Metro Teen AIDS, how would you suggest Montgomery County address the HIV AIDS epidemic that disproportionately impacts black women? Uh, what considerations are necessary to close the racial disparities in HIV infection rates? And then more generally, what kind of resources um, should the county make available to its residents to close racial health disparities that we are not providing? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question. Um, well, first, I just want to acknowledge that um, we are in a space that I didn't actually think was going to be imaginable when I was entering this work 2009, where HIV is a essentially being managed as a chronic disease due to the advancement of drugs and other pharmacological therapies. With that said, we mm -hmm. want to prevent infections. That doesn't mean we want people um, to say, oh, well, we have new methods and treatments, so now it's okay to get HIV. No, we don't want people to get HIV. I think um, there are a couple of different um, strategies that can be taken um, because it's at my core I can't help it health education <laughs> it's always a huge piece but I think we need to balance that with you can't just tell people these are all of the ways that you can protect yourself when you are engaged in activities that could result in an HIV transmission um, because there are very real circumstances where individuals if we're talking specifically about black women as you highlighted might not feel comfortable or might not have the power they might be in a power imbalance relationship right that might put harm for them to be able to negotiate condom use or other of these um, uh, harm reduction practices. I think the other thing um, that we need to think about is how do we increase knowledge and awareness around the, the advances we've had in pharmacological therapy for PrEP, right? If you've been exposed to HIV, PrEP is, is, is for everybody regardless, um, regardless of who you are. So how do we a, make sure that people know that that's an option, but B, reduce the stigma and increase the access to them being able to access those services. Because we hear horror stories all the time of um, individuals feeling that they've been stigmatized or discriminated against when they've gone to seek out PrEP, they're not able to get the prescriptions, right? Um, even if they have done everything we need them to do. So again, how do we partner with our healthcare community to make sure that everybody has the knowledge and the information to be able um, to support our residents who want to engage in those services to um, be able to do so. Um, I would also say that we need to think, um, we need to think broadly about uh, the harm, you know, what other harm reduction strategies. And I will say, um, because I don't believe in speaking on things I'm not super well versed in, I need to look at the most recent report on what are the drivers of the rates. Is it sexual activity? Is it OUD, right? Um, particularly for black and brown, um, for black women. So I look forward, um, Council Member Sales, to having another conversation with you once I've had an opportunity to actually dig into that and understand a little bit more what the situation looks like um, within the county. Thank you. This is a really serious issue when not only the contraction rates are high, but also the disparities yes. of the population. And so I look forward to discussing those with you. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Council Member Lukey. Thank you, and, and thank you for your comments about PrEP and the importance of that. And I do know there is a bill in the House and Senate this year in the state legislature to um, allow pharmacists and healthcare providers to dispense prophylactic medications without an order, which would help reduce some of the, the, the yeah. challenges you were just discussing. So um, I think that's already been heard in both chambers, so I'm keeping an eye on it. Um, I am sorry that I did not get to meet you before today, but what a wonderful pleasure it is to have you here and all of your enthusiasm. And um, I really appreciate the comments you made earlier about the importance of not just looking at the top county level data to try to discern what's happening and where and how do we address it. Um, and, I, and I know you had a publication on value-based preventive care and, and population health. And just so you know, for me, preventive care is both behavioral health care and your primary care and the intersection of the two, which is where it should be. But um, I don't know that we've gotten there yet as a society, um, more broadly speaking. Um, so in talking about disaggregation of data to help inform the work that you're going to be doing, um, 
how would you utilize uh, data that's disaggregated down to zip code, but then further disaggregated by age, race, and gender to inform some of the most pressing public health um, challenges that the county's facing? Yeah, so um, obviously the more layers we're able to drill down, the better we're able to get um, a clearer focus on where the problems actually are. Um, and when we talk about place-based health, right, mm -hmm. being able to target our resources and our programs to those specific zip codes and to the populations within those specific zip codes. Even though Montgomery County is one county, um, each zip code, each community right. has its own culture. Poolsville is different from Wheaton, which is different mm -hmm. from Silver Spring. Um, they have their own distinct cultures and their own distinct norms and the way that, you know, folks operate. And so being able to disaggregate data down to that level um, will allow us to actually create culturally relevant programs that are tailored to the individuals in those communities. Um, also, it allows us to be able to see if we're making progress, right? Mm -hmm. Often when we're doing program evaluations, we are not seeing progress until one to three years after because right. that is the frequency with which the um, interventions have been done. Um, we, uh, working in the value-based care space, um, we rely a lot on that real-time flow of metrics data. We're talking six to eight week cycles mm -hmm. where we can do these PDSA cycles, we can assess what's happening, we can identify an intervention, implement it, look at that data in real time to see if it worked, do we need to tweak it, and then do another cycle. We need to be able to bring that level of agility and acuity to public health, to our programs when we're looking at that disaggregate, disaggregated data to see if we're truly making an impact. And if we're not, how do we need to pivot to be able to mm -hmm. get where we need to be? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. And, and Dr. Bridgers, I'll send you the link to that bill. <laughs> Thank you. Next up, Councilmember Mink. Thank you. So glad to have you here today. It's just been um, a really impressive and exciting uh, conversation so far. Um, really wanted to uh, just mention my appreciation for the conversation so far about the mental health issues that we're facing, especially with our young people, the way it's showing up um, in schools, the way it's showing up in public safety issues, um, as well as the conversation around the lack of trans health care that we have uh, here in this area, uh, with appreciation, of course, for Councilmember Stewart and that um, OLO report, which really highlighted the issues that so many um, families and community members have been experiencing here on the ground. Um, um, and I also really appreciate your focus on data, the importance of using data to figure out exactly where our problems are, especially on a micro level and especially um, as we uh, assess it out exactly how uh, those racial disparities and other disparities are impacting the community and then using evidence-based practices to address them. Um, I did notice that in the conversation around the fentanyl crisis, um, you are mention of harm reduction initiatives and principles, that's incredibly important, so thank you for your focus there. Um, I wanted to bring up a topic that we haven't heard about yet. Um, as I'm sure you saw, there was a recent uh, Senate committee hearing on long COVID. Mm -hmm. um, this is not a, uh, a like politically popular issue, but I think that's why it's important to have the conversation. And uh, and I get the vibe that you are focused on health and not politics. Yeah. Um, so you know what they talked about there was how you know along with the escalating health impact. Um, it's also uh, a drain on the nation's economy. We don't know numbers here at the local level, but they are very significant, certainly at the national level, um, with uh, numbers approximated around 4 million people out of work, $170 billion in lost wages. Obviously, this is probably an underestimation, uh, given the difficulty in getting a diagnosis. Um, and we also know that uh, economically disadvantaged populations have been disproportionately affected by long COVID, along with, no surprise Surprise here, um, African Americans and Hispanic Americans who are experiencing higher rates of long COVID. So the hearing there focused on research and on improving patient care, but as you have highlighted, prevention obviously is always preferable. And here in Montgomery County, we are of course ahead of the game there because of the good work of uh, HHS, of the previous council, um, and of so many of the community-based organizations that we partnered with during the height of the pandemic. So I wondered about your thoughts about how we can continue that work and can continue to stay ahead of the eight ball here in Montgomery County at a moment where folks are tired of hearing about COVID, everybody wants to be uh, going to school and doing their jobs and making sure that our economy is continuing to improve. Um, but 
you know, again, we want to stay ahead of the game, and we, what we don't want to see is years from now uh, the impacts of not taking it seriously impacting us in all of these different ways. So what are your thoughts on that, uh, and especially here in Montgomery County? Yeah, absolutely. And just, again, want to reiterate my thanks to the council, to Dr. Bridgers, to the department for your incredible leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, COVID is still here, as we're all aware. While we are not in crisis mode that we were before, we know that we have many individuals within our community who are still high risk, and they have not resumed to normal life, right? Even though the rest of the world has continued um, to move on. Um, I think as we think about the strategies that have been put in place, we need to continue to leverage those, right? And I think we have to think creatively and strategically about our communication around this, right? But it, the days of you need to wear a mask, you need to do this, you need to do that, is probably not the message to resonate at this phase of the pandemic. But how do we incorporate those good COVID practices into routine care, right? You get your annual flu shot, get your COVID shot. We're still washing our hands for 20 seconds, right? We're still staying home if we're not well. These are basic public health practices that expand beyond COVID. They also help with flu and I have small children, so hand, foot and mouth and every other contagion my two and five year old bring home, right? Um, so we need to be able to not have COVID be a separate thing when we're talking about prevention strategies, but this is just how we stay and achieve health, right? Um, unfortunately, because of the politicalization of COVID when the epidemic was here, there's often a negative connotation associated with anything that, that even the best intention, if we're, it, we're like, this is for your own benefit and this is for your own good. But the we, we have to think carefully about, we can't go back to preaching. Right? We have to think about how is this just normal practice? How is this just part of your annual wellness visit, your annual checkup? How are we working with the healthcare community to communicate those messages? And also, how are we reducing barriers for people to continue to get vaccinated? It is very hard to find COVID vaccines. I had to go call like five different places to get my own COVID vaccine. I wound up being able to go to Wheaton Mall <laughs> um, and use one of the county vaccination sites mm -hmm. for me and my children. Um, thank you. That was very helpful. Um, but how, how do we make sure we're also reducing barriers um, to folks being able to engage in good preventive behaviors um, to prevent COVID? And then for folks that are experiencing long COVID, do we have a mechanism to identify who they are? What supports can we provide them when we think about lost wages, disability, things of that nature from a policy perspective and those policy levers to really help them as they are managing and dealing with this new normal? Great, thank you. Yeah, I'm sure. I was trying to do my part to do a public service announcement that COVID is still here. So I contracted COVID <laughs> on the day that I, a couple days before I was, <laughs> Uh, elected by colleagues to be council president, and uh, oh, no. but I appreciate the the point, and I'm case in point that uh, this is still uh, with us and something that we need to be. And I had gotten my vaccine, and so having sat next to you, I didn't get it. So there you go. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Next up, uh, uh, Councilmember Balcom. Um, thank you. I appreciate you being here today, and, and um, clearly you're the right person for the job. Uh, and thank you for the time that you took in, in conversation. Um, this is a rare opportunity for us, all of us, to lobby you on the things that are important to us. And so um, it's a uh, it's great opportunity. I don't have a question. I just wanted to highlight, you know, we have many residents who don't have access to health care for very many reasons. And you've talked about a lot of those today. Um, one of the populations that we've talked about is our rural community, uh, our, um, rural residents, farm workers that just don't have access. And I appreciate uh, the time uh, uh, and, and your experience in rural health care. Uh, so I appreciate that. I do just wanted to elevate what um, Councilmember Albernos mentioned about partnerships yeah. and uh, the work with our nonprofit community because they, they are the people who really are on the front lines and they see these unseen populations. And so I, um, I appreciate your commitment to work with our nonprofits to make sure that all of our residents have uh, the health care they need. So I appreciate that. And ditto to many things that everybody said already. So thank you. Thank you. As he likes to say, all the questions have been asked, but not necessarily by him. So let me turn it to Council Member uh, Katz. <laughs> I, th I think it should be noted, Dr. Ashford, that they wait for the last to be the best. You know that. Yeah, yes. yeah. And they're not going to agree with that. But anyhow, 
Uh, first off, thank you so very, very much for applying. And, and I uh, want to associate myself with many of the questions that my colleagues have already asked. They, Councilmember Glass already asked about and discussed the opioid crisis and, and, uh, and uh, the mental health crisis has been discussed by many. Just yesterday, just yesterday, we had a joint health and human services committee and public safety committee, I'm the chair of the public safety committee, uh, uh, meeting and Dr. Bridgers was very busy dual tasking uh, answers and, uh, uh, and texted Dr. Stoddard during, during our meeting. But the bottom line is that we, um, we have a problem that we need to make certain that nothing is siloed, that we work together and, and you're joining a group that is working together with other departments, that we work together to get a better and the best outcome that we can possibly get from, from all of our, of our, for all of our, our public. And, and that's very easy to say and very difficult to do, but we do it. And, and I just wanted to say that, that your answers have been very impressive. I look forward to voting for you. But you are joining an unbelievable team. And, and I would say that if they weren't here. <laughs> but I like to tease people. But I, you are joining an unbelievable team whether, with Dr. Bridgers, with Dr. Davis. We can go down the list of names. And you will be in a, a terrific uh, part of that team. I look forward to voting for you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you so much for being here. I'll just note that Dr. Davis is here. Uh, Christine Hong was here earlier. And uh, the three of us were, were out uh, earlier uh, uh, for the point in time survey till nearly 3 o'clock in the morning. And it's just a window for, for me and for several colleagues uh, into what our hardworking Department of Health and Human Services teams, our community partners, our public health team does on a daily and a nightly basis uh, and the commitment that the team that you are joining uh, has shown and will continue to show your, your energy and your intellect and your investment and commitment to these issues is, uh, is obvious. Uh, you know, the, the health care bear, I think, uh, public health care bear. Uh, so we appreciate that, that story uh, to, to, to the director that you're going to work closely with. And uh, we uh, look forward to uh, taking up this nomination more formally, but really appreciate your, your interest and your willingness to serve and wanting to bring your talent forward to serve our residents. So thank you so much. Okay, colleagues, I like that. All right, we're going to move on to item two on the agenda here. <laughs> but hopefully we're going to move uh, through very quickly. The council is required to set the spending affordability guidelines for the capital improvements program by the first Tuesday in February. Council Member Stewart, would you please share the government operations and fiscal policy recommendations? Great. Uh, during our January 24th meeting of uh, the GO Committee, we unanimously recommended that the council retain the council adopted CIP spending uh, affordability guidelines from September of 2023. Our reasoning was the fiscal conditions since the fall have not changed to warrant a change in the adopted guidelines. And I thank our excellent staff for their analysis and support in this. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee has made the uh, you know, has made a recommendation. Uh, and, and there's a motion. Uh, those in favor of adopting the CIP spending affordability guidelines as recommended by the GO Committee, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. And now we'll move on to item three. We'll take action on the spending affordability guidelines for the FY25 operating budget. Chair Stewart, turn back to you to share the Government uh, Operations Fiscal Policy Committee's recommendations. Great. Um, each year, the Council must adopt guidelines for the next operating budget by the second Tuesday in February. The spending affordability guidelines that must be adopted are one, a ceiling on the funding from ad valorem real property tax revenues, two, a ceiling on the aggregate operating budget, and three, separate budget allocations for all agencies and certain non-agency uses. The GO Committee met on February 1st, reviewed the relevant economic conditions, and made the following unanimous recommendations for the FY25 operating budget spending affordability guidelines. First, we're, we um, unanimously recommend set the ceiling on funding from ad valorem real property tax revenues at the average weighted property tax rate approved in FY24. That is consistent with prior years and the December 2023 fiscal plan update. 
Second, set the ceiling on the aggregate operating budget at $6.2 million. This re represents a 3.09% increase from the FY24 approved aggregate operating budget based on the estimated increase in personal income for 2023 plus an additional $80.6 million to reflect the proposed use of one-time reserves in the FY25 budget for capital projects. Um, this was included in the executive's recommended FY25 to 30 CIP. Finally, we um, unanimously uh, recommend allocating the proposed aggregate operating budgets as detailed in the packet for all agencies and certain non-agency uses. Um, again, these were unanimous recommendations from the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee has made the motion. Those in favor of adopting the CIP spending affordability guidelines as recommended by the GO Committee, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. We're going to move on to item four. The council will now sit as the district council to take final action on zoning text amendment 2308, transferable development rights cemetery. Uh, this uh, is... Uh, uh, was before the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee. Uh, it was sponsored by Councilmember Balcom, who I'll turn to in a moment. Under the current zoning ordinance, a cemetery is prohibited if the lot or parcel on which the cemetery would be located is in the AR zone and is encumbered by a recorded transfer development rights easement. CTA 2308 would allow a property owner in the AR zone to expand a cemetery onto the lot that currently has a TDR. The PHP committee recommends approval with an amendment limiting the expansion to 10 acres on an abutting lot or parcel one time. This was reflecting a uh, suggestion and recommendation by the sponsor at the request of many members of the uh, Ag Advisory Community and Ag Advisory Committee, uh, as well as uh, supported by the county executive. Uh, so there is a committee uh, recommendation uh, with that amendment, before we take that up, I'll turn it uh, to the sponsor, Councilmember Balcom, for any comments. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the committee's work on this. And just for just a little brief background, in creating the Agricultural Reserve and the Companion Transferable Development Rights, decisions were made as to the various land uses that were specifically allowed or prohibited in land encumbered by a TDR. One of those specific exclusions was cemeteries. And uh, the TDR program was developed 40 years ago. And as we look at the future of the Ag Reserve for the next 40 years, we need to also look at the uh, future of cemeteries uh, and the need to accommodate additional barriers. So this, the goal of this CTA was narrowly focused to allow existing cemeteries to continue to perform a vital function in the community. And um, the original t intent was to allow existing cemeteries to expand on abutting properties. I appreciate the amendment that came through. This is a one-time expansion for a limit of 10 acres. Uh, so I uh, respectfully ask for your approval of the CTA. Thank you. Thank you to the sponsor. Thank you to the collaboration with the executive branch and with stakeholders in the community. Obviously not uh, an issue that we frequently talk about or would like to talk about, but something that's very important uh, as we figure out how to uh, deal with those losses in our community in a dignified way and provide opportunities for loved ones to uh, be able to have access to it. Uh, with that, there is a Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee recommendation, um, and we need to take a roll call. Madam Clerk, could you please read the, call, uh, read the roll? Councilmember Lukey? Yes. Councilmember Lukey votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Albernos? Yes. Councilmember Albernos votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Friedson? Yes. Councilmember Friedson votes yes. Okay, that is unanimous. Uh, thank you to Councilmember Balcom uh, for that zoning text amendment. Uh, next for the council is the consent calendar. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. 
Uh, moved by Councilmember Sales, seconded by Vice President Stewart. All in favor of approval of the consent calendar? That is unanimous. Uh, let me turn it briefly to uh, Councilmember Jawanda. I just wanted to call out the uh, Kia Hyundai resolution. I appreciate it. Part of the reason we introduced it is to get it, people to know that there's a problem. Last last uh, month, 60% of the cars stolen were Kia and Hyundai's. This resolution, which we just passed, is calls on a joins an effort, including Baltimore and other cities across the, across the country, asking for a national recall because these are defective cars. Um, and want, want people to be aware of that and also just appreciate the collaboration and support from all my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that as well. I also want to note the accessory dwelling units report. This is something that I requested of the Office of Legislative Oversight. The goal is to ensure that as we move forward with the zoning change that we are actually moving forward to increase housing options for more residents uh, in our com community to, to create more opportunities for affordable attainable housing to allow for uh, loved ones uh, our older adult population those with disabilities uh, to be able to live in uh, independent and dignified spaces but also uh, with close proximity uh, to loved ones uh, so uh, there are a number of uh, recommendations in that look forward to increased uh, discussion and more opportunities to look into those issues and appreciate the office of legislative oversight for their thoughtful work and uh, colleagues uh, for uh, their support uh, of that uh, initiative okay we are uh, we were behind schedule and uh, the level of unanimity on those uh, legislative issues don't take for granted colleagues, but we're now a couple minutes ahead of schedule uh, for our Black History Month commemoration. Our All right. I took a minute to enter into that. Now we're officially on schedule just to make sure our, our guests are here. Next up on our agenda is uh, a truly special commemoration that I'm very honored to host alongside council members Juwando and Sales, as well as the full council, uh, and that is our annual Black History Month commemoration. Each February, we honor the contributions and achievements of black Americans who have shaped our community and our nation. It is also time to celebrate black history through music, dance, and art, and recognize the cultural impact and legacy of black Americans in the arts. The theme for this year's commemoration is African Americans and the arts. I'm thrilled that this year's celebration shines a light on local artists and educators who are sharing and preserving culture through art, dance, and education. Montgomery County is home to more than 200,000 people who identify as black or African American. Our rich diversity is one of the many wonderful aspects of why it is so great and why we are so proud to live in Montgomery County. It's why so many people from across the world choose Montgomery County as their home and why gathering to celebrate the rich cultures that make up our community here is so important and why we are so proud to do it from this dais. As we honor their contributions, we also pause to reflect on the remarkable resilience of the black, of the black American community displayed in the face of oppression throughout our nation's history and honor the people and events who have truly shaped our country. Guided by the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, we work to bend the arc of the moral universe towards justice in Montgomery County every day, not just during the month of February. We all share a commitment to working together to build a more inclusive and equitable future for all. Before I turn it over to colleagues, I wanted to recognize Jordan Lindsay and, and Joe Thompson who have put together a wonderful video, uh, but we're going to get to that in a moment. And I think we're going to turn it to uh, colleagues, Councilmember Juwando and Sales first. Uh, let me uh, turn it over first to Councilmember Juwando and then to Councilmember Sales, and then we'll turn it to staff to queue up the video. Councilmember Juwando. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm thankful that. Uh, God's allowed me to be here another year uh, in this seat um, at this time in history to celebrate another Black History Month. Uh, this year's theme uplifts the role that black artists have played in our lives, our culture, and our social movements. Uh, whether it's uh, Beyonce's record-shattering Renaissance tour, 
Raise your hand if you got to go. Okay. It's all the movie. That's that's how I went. I, I went through I went through the movie. Amazing or amazing films that demonstrate the depth and breadth of the Black American experience, like American Fiction, Origin, uh, or The Color Purple, or the dynamic artists that we're going to highlight today here in Montgomery County. Throughout history, Black Americans have harnessed the arts as a means of innovation, preservation, education, and resistance. Indeed, there is no segment of American culture that has not been significantly influenced by black artists. That reach and impact, I would argue, has never been more important than it is now to many of us in the black community. As we seek to navigate what is seemingly a multi-pronged attack on the black community, from efforts to erase and water down our history related to race, limiting access to the ballot box, or attacks on DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and on black leaders themselves, we find ourselves this month in dire times. The forced resignation of Claudine Gay, an impeccable scholar as president of Harvard University, who was the first black woman in person in more than 387 years to lead that institution, has shaken us. We're not immune here where in this body just last year, we celebrated Dr. Monifa McKnight as a trailblazer for black history. And less than a year later, she was forced to resign. These attacks have shaken us. They remind us that it's not enough to celebrate our great leaders and artists in a performative way, but we want real recognition and equality in equity. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't give voice to that in this seat today. I know I'm not the only African American in this room who's felt that way this month and all year. So I would ask that as we celebrate Black History Month, let's remember it's not just a celebration, it's a commitment to true diversity, equity, and inclusion, to lifting up racial equity and social justice, to supporting our leaders, and not tearing them down. That's what I hope we will all remember this Black History Month. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Joanna, uh, Councilmember Sales. Um, thank you, Council President. Um, I just want to also extend my deep appreciation to the Public Information Office for uh, the exceptional Black History Month program that they have put forth for us, which has become a tradition. Um, I'm really excited about the um, numerous residents that have joined us this afternoon to celebrate Black History Month. Um, that demonstrate the strength, unity, and solidarity of the black community residents here in Montgomery County. As the first black woman representing the at-large district on the Montgomery County Council, I value the significance of my position and I don't take this lightly. Um, the theme for this year's observance of African Americans and uh, the arts inspires me to recognize prominent black African Americans who have made history through their artistic expression. Uh, for instance, Bob Marley, born in my native country of Jamaica, used his music to inspire hope, justice, and unity throughout America and worldwide. His life and music has been celebrated uh, in the 2024 documentary, One Love. It's coming out this summer, so please be on the lookout to enjoy this film. Actors like Chadwick Boseman, um, who we lost last year, have brilliantly depicted the black uh, experience in America in adaptations such as Thurgood Marshall um, and he also inspired countless black children and adults and has reinvigorated a commitment to STEM education, portraying the superhero Black Panther. Taraji P. Henson has masterfully highlighted the struggles of women 
um, black women in particular in male-dominated fields in movies such as Hidden Figures, um, and most recently in The Color Purple, revisited the um, racial wealth gap that black women have experienced in film. Moreover, I want to highlight the work of Cynthia Terrell Johnson, um, a nationally recognized artist who lived 25 years as a United States diplomat before settling in Silver Spring. She draws inspiration from various artistic traditions and forms of expression and shares her art with the public. Last year, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of hip hop, and I had the honor of attending the Hip Hop Nutcracker show at the Strathmore Court. The diverse and joyous audience in the room was a testament to this music's genres, numerous contributions to our world and our country. We are fortunate to have this opportunity to celebrate and appreciate the contributions of Black America over time. Today, Black culture has attained unprecedented levels of recognition and success. America had its first black president in Barack Obama, and now we have our first black governor and the only black governor in the nation here in the state of Maryland in Westmore. While there is still an enormous amount of progress toward achieving full, true liberation, uh, black artists can now express their feelings and experiences more freely. We are seeing more stories of black people who have attained success and who have made it to the top. Uh, once again, I want to thank everyone who joined us today. I want to thank my colleague for his remarks um, to speak to the times that we are in. Um, I'm so honored to serve with him and for you at this moment in this position. Um, it is a privilege to serve on this 11-member body, and I look forward to learning more about the remarkable artists of the black diaspora in Montgomery County. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sales and Councilmember Jawando. It's an honor and privilege to be able to serve alongside you and really appreciate your comments. I uh, want to recognize before we turn it over to the video, we have many special guests here. I am not going to acknowledge everybody. Everybody who's here is a special guest. Uh, but we do have several elected officials and representatives of elected officials. I want to acknowledge the county executive uh, is uh, here. We have uh, Kathleen Connor, the district chief for uh, Congressman Raskin, and I believe the entire district team of Cong Congressman Raskin. I'm looking around, and I don't think anybody is not here. So we appreciate uh, his uh, support and the entire team's uh, effort and, and uh, partnership. We have uh, Kevin Mack from Senator Cardin's office uh, is uh, here representing uh, him. And I uh, uh, know that we have many people representing many organizations and, and, and groups, and we appreciate the incredible collection of public servants uh, who are in the room, some of whom are appointed and some of whom are elected and uh, others of, of whom, uh, based on their own volition, uh, choose uh, to serve our community every day. So we appreciate that. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to our team, Jordan Lindsay and Joe Thompson, who, uh, along with our uh, public information office and communications team, have put together uh, an outstanding video that I know we're all looking forward uh, to seeing, which highlights uh, many of the outstanding leaders that we have in our community and the incredible contributions uh, in the arts and culture and beyond. So with that, I'll turn it to you, Jordan and Joe. for 2024 is African Americans and the art. This video will highlight the many impacts black Americans have had throughout history on visual arts, music, dance, cultural movements, and more. The many sounds of music helped uplift African Americans through challenging times then, and it still does to this day. Music from the African American culture not only helped with motivation through enduring times like the Jim Crow era. Strange fruit. So 
civil rights movement and the black power movement it also influenced and inspired people throughout the entire world from church gospel to jazz rhythm and blues to motown and funk and music in the african-american culture has evolved throughout the years in 50 years hip-hop has done what no other genre has been able to do on a global level Montgomery Blair High School social studies teacher Kenneth Smith breaks it all down in the classroom. I will treat you to Chipotle if anybody can tell me who this is. Smith teaches a unique course that's one of the first in the nation. The course is hip hop history and culture and it's taught from a historical and sociological perspective. So we are in the social studies department. K through 12, very few public schools in the country teach a course specifically about hip hop. Look at the lyrics, and what do you think about the song overall? I always say that if it weren't for hip hop, I wouldn't be a teacher. Whenever I enter a room, hip hop enters with me. Now, this is Roxanne Shante. She was notorious for being an outspoken, dope battle MC. Artists such as KRS One, Public Enemy, Chuck D, the Jungle Brothers, the whole Native Tongues, they really got me thinking critically about the world around me. And it was fascinating to see, especially young black men, telling their truths in such an aggressive and confident way. Hip hop, we're here. We're not going anywhere. We're here. Just like music, African Americans have used dance as another form of art. Dance forms have also morphed throughout the years. Today, it can be seen in many forms. Dance is the language I use to speak to God. It is movement personified when words fail you. Local folklore educator and professional dancer Angela Ingram began her career at the age of nine in ballet, jazz, tap, and Hawaiian. She also often teaches classes here at Montgomery College's Cultural Arts Center, located in Silver Spring. Dance is a sacredness, and has been a sacredness in our culture continuously still to this day. It's a sacredness of how we choose to represent ourselves through movement. Without the arts, there probably would be no history. Black artists have always influenced the culture significantly, and we're always the forefront in cultures. What inspired me to be a folklore specialist was understanding that I could speak history through movement. My specialty now is like Afro-Brazilian, Afro-Cuban, understanding with the Gullah Geechee culture in South Carolina, understanding what it is in Cuba and that folklore revelation in terms of if you just turn off the sound when you watch people dance, you will not know where they come from. My culture is significant, and I will always be true to that culture. Artwork within the black American community is another form of expression. Art has a way of articulating things that words can't. Local award-winning artist Levi Robinson has a studio located in Rockville, and his artwork speaks to you. I choose most often to paint with this dark palette because, you know, I just like to bring the light out of the darkness. By taking a critical view of social, political, and cultural issues as they relate to the black experience while also incorporating the civil rights movement, hip hop, jazz, sports, and urban landscapes. You know, my work is inspired by our, our experience, you know. Um, how we've, um, we've overcome adversity, the lessons learned, the obstacles we still face. I wanna convey that we exist and that we're important. Our viewpoint is important, our aesthetic is important. So the one image is actually the silhouette of an American and I have this young African man inside that silhouette to signify we are them, they are us. The way that we express ourselves is just as significant as any other culture. African American heritage and culture remains resilient while continuing to evolve and grow into its authentic beauty, which has and always will be reflected in the arts. Happy Black History Month to the residents of Montgomery County. Happy Black History Month, Montgomery County. To Montgomery County, 
Happy Black History Month. Well done to our team. What an outstanding example of just the incredible talent that we have in our community. Angela, Kenneth, and Levi, thank you so much. We are going to invite you up to actually formally present you with the proclamation in a moment, but first we're going to read it here uh, from the dais with all 11 of us participating, and I will begin. The Montgomery County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, whereas... February is National Black History Month, which recognizes and honors contributions that African Americans have made to this country, as well as the events and history of the African diaspora, and whereas on January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation setting the United States on a path to end slavery, and one century later, in 1963, more than 200,000 Americans gathered for the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, calling for African-American civil and economic rights and... Whereas Black History Month had its beginnings in the United States in 1926, when black educator and historian Carter G. Woodson moved to officially recognize the achievements and contributions of African-Americans to our nation's history and identity and... Whereas black history is complicated and unlike any other story ever told. As enslaved Africans were brought to this country under brutal conditions, and those who survived from generations of enslaved Africans became educators, doctors, scientists, and world changers. And whereas Maryland is home to African American heroes like Frederick Douglass, Josiah Henson, Harriet Tubman, and Thurgood Marshall, who paved the way for young activists of today who continue the fight for racial equity, freedom, and social justice, and Whereas, black Americans have contributed significantly to the growth and development of our nation and Montgomery County through distinguished leadership in every field of human endeavor, and Whereas, this year's National Black History Month theme is African Americans and the Arts, highlighting how African Americans have impacted visual arts, dance, music, fashion, folklore, language, film, cultural movements, and more in the U.S. and across the globe. And Whereas African American art fuses African, Caribbean, and Black African lived experiences and include the contributions of countless artists. Despite the history of African American artistry being denied and minimized, it has significant global impact. And whereas from national award-winning artists, dancers, and musicians to local up-and-coming talent, African Americans have shaped all artistic fields and led historical, cultural movements like the Black Renaissance of the 1920s and 1930s and the black arts movement of the 1960s, which brought international prestige to African-American music, art, and literature, and... Whereas in music, African-American artistry has led to the creation of some of the greatest music genres, including blues, jazz, rock and roll, hip-hop, and more, while in literature and visual arts, the unique perspectives in Afrofuturist works imagine a future for black people without oppressive systems and examine the intersection of black history, modern society, and science and technology, and... Whereas African American artistic heritage is central to our shared American history and culture, it continues to evolve to this day, showcasing the great beauty of American dreams and values. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby proclaims February as Black History Month, and be it further resolved that all residents are encouraged to recognize and celebrate the outstanding achievements of African Americans who have greatly enriched our community. Presented on this sixth day of February in the year 2024 by myself, Andrew Friedson, as Council President, Will Juwando, and Lorianne Sales, Council Members, and the entire Montgomery County Council. Happy Black History Month. Okay, we're going to invite up Angela, Kenneth, and Levi uh, here to formally present you with uh, these proclamations. All of our invited guests, if you'd like to join us as well uh, in the picture, you're welcome to join us uh, up here as well. And 
uh, the whole council will come down and we'll uh, and, and, and we'll present this now. Thank you everybody for joining us for our Black History Month commemoration. To our invited guests, we have uh, a reception upstairs on the fourth floor, and with that, uh, we are now adjourned and in recess until 1.30.